Was that fun? I know you didn't get to dunk it or nothing, but we're starting a new series. Thank you, John. Look at that hat. Let's give him a hand for that hat again. Amen. <laughs> and we want to make this series exciting for you. I know we have a lot of things through it. We have a, another opportunity for you to win a, an amazing gift at the end of this series. And uh, you have to sign in and register at the back on your way in. But the point of this series is to understand that in life, life throws you madness sometimes. How many of you have ever been through the madness of life? Lift your hand. I'm talking about where just all hell breaks loose and it's crazy. Everything around you seems wild and crazy and there is no peace around. Have you ever felt like that season just has not stopped yet? But we're going to go through this and through the emotions. This basketball theme, because it's March Madness. How many basketball fans do we have in the house? We have some. I used to love basketball, but I liked it back in the days when Jordan played. Uh-huh. Some of, the, some of the good basketball. I think a lot of them are, are babies nowadays. How many of you agree with me on that? But we want to theme it on that, on the fact of, like, I normally don't wear this get-up, but today, someone say today, he gets to be comfortable. Um but to understand that there are things that we all go through and the struggles of life are not easy. But I want you to look around and see that you're not alone. And what you're going through, you are not alone. There is someone that is sitting next to you that could be your best friend. There is someone in this room that has been through exactly what you've been through. I guarantee you that. And even if not, can I tell you that there is a heavenly father that loves you, that has walked in your shoes before. Amen. There is a God that fully understands what you are going through right now. And can I tell you that you are not alone? Tell your neighbor you are not alone. We're going to begin reading in the book of Acts chapter 27. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. If you have your glowing Bible, how many of you know what your glowing Bible is? That's your iPhone or your other phone. Go ahead and just pull your Bible app up to Acts chapter 27. And if you don't have it with you, it's okay, because we will have it up here on the screen. And I'm going to read you a story about a man named Paul, the Apostle Paul. How many of you love hearing from Paul? Paul, the author, the, the gentleman who started his life off in a rough way, a hard way, a murderer, a very man that you would be afraid to con be confronted by on the streets. But yet the Bible talked about there was a time in his life of conversion that God had met him. Amen. On the road to Damascus, and we know the story, and I'm not preaching about that today, but in this passage we see that Paul is now a prisoner, and he's on a boat, and they're headed to Rome. We pick up in verse 13, it says, all of a sudden as they're on the boat, and I want you to capture, there's so much in this, I'm probably going to have to make this a two-week thing. Well, let's pray. Father, have your way in this service today. Do as you please in this house, Father. We are prepared. We are ready with an agenda, but I pray that you take over. Do what you want to do in our lives, Lord God. Have your way, Lord God, as we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. So they are now in the boat, and the Bible says, when a gentle wind from the south started blowing, that's when the men thought it was a good idea, and it was time to do what they had planned, in other words. How many of you know that's how we are? God, if you fix everything for me, then I'll start serving you. Or God, if you can just do this, then I will do that. So many times I've asked people, I said, you know, will you come to church? And they said, well, I'm, I'm just not there yet. I'm not ready to come to church yet. Look, yeah, that's the perfect time to come to church. Amen? That's what you need to do. There's things in my life I've got to fix before I come to church. No, it's not. That's how you get those things fixed. Come into the house of God. Amen? So it says they pulled up the anchor, and we sailed along the coast to Crete. But soon, someone say, but soon, because this is what's coming your way eventually. It says a strong wind called the Northeastern. And, and I looked this up. This was actually a cyclone. In our day, it would be considered like a hurricane, if you will. I came from Florida, and I've been through hurricanes. And it's pretty scary. I've actually been in the water in the middle of a massive storm, thought we were going under, and it's not a place that you would want to be. It said it blew against us from the island. The wind struck the ship and we could not sail against it. So we let down the wind or we let the wind carry the ship. We went along the island of Kadah on the side that was protected from the wind. We had a hard time holding the lifeboat in place. But finally, someone say finally, we got it where it belonged. 
Then the sailors wrapped ropes around the ship to hold it together. You ever felt like you're just hanging on by a thread? You ever felt like you're just going to get whatever you can and grab it to try to hold this thing together because it's falling apart? We move on down to verse 42. It says this. It says, The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners. What had happened in between all of this, I don't got time to go into all of it, but Paul was told by the angel of the Lord, he said, look, if you guys will just remain on this ship, then you won't die. Tell the people that. And at one point, the Bible talks about how the soldiers were about to drop down a lifeboat and get on it. And Paul said, if you get on that lifeboat, then you will all die. Stay on the boat. I've been told by God. How many of you know that it's important to be obedient to God, even though you might not feel like it's the right thing to do? You might feel like it's a very fearful thing to do. It's good to obey God. It says the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoner. At least any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. And the rest on planks or pieces, someone say pieces, pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. If you go through this later on, you'll begin to understand, and I've preached through this chapter several times, that every time that I study it, God shows me a new revelation of what was going on. That there was a purpose for Paul to be imprisoned. There was a purpose for Paul to be on this particular boat at this particular time. And it wasn't just for the men that were on that boat. But it was also, we see later on in chapter 28, the Bible talks about how as soon as they got off the boat and they got onto dry ground to a group of people who worship false gods, the Bible said that Paul goes up and he goes to warm his hands on the fire. You guys know the story, right? And as soon as that happened, he he, he put his hand toward the fire and the Bible says a viper came out and bit him on the hand. They're all waiting on Paul to die. They're waiting on him to swell up and just to fall over. But the Bible says he shook it off. Tell someone he shook it off. Amen? He shook it off and they thought he was a God. But it didn't stop there. There was more to the purpose. The Bible says later on that there was a man by the name of Publis. He was the man that entertained the island, but his father was sick and about to die. So the Bible says that Paul went to him. He visited him. He laid his hands on him and he was healed. Amen? There is purpose in the plan that God has for you. But how many of you know that the plan that God has for you doesn't always look like the plan that you have for you, right? Now, it may look good. God may say you are going to all four corners of the world and you're going to preach the gospel. Has God ever told someone in this room that you're going overseas to speak and you're going to minister and and you're going on a mission trip or God's going to start a new ministry in your life, whatever it may be. But yet God doesn't always tell you how you're going to get there, how that's going to happen. He knows if he tells you how, then you'll back away from it. If he shows you the steps, fear may arise in you and your faith may be diminished. But in my text, as we follow the Apostle Paul, today is called marching through the storm. How many of you know that the storm is necessary? Coming from Florida, being in some of the craziest storms, and I was born in Texas. How many people from Texas do we have in the house? One, two, three. Okay. That's a different country. But coming from Texas, there's a lot of tornadoes. There's a lot of storms that if you are not from that area or you're not from Florida, then you would be scared to death. I remember the first time I was in a storm in Florida, completely different than the storm in Texas. The one in Texas, I mean, you have tornadoes, you have wind blowing, a lot of lightning. My grandma had a storm cellar. You guys know what a storm cellar is? And and right outside of her old little house, you you go out and there's this giant metal door with this chain with a weight on the other end of it that helps lift this heavy door. She sleeps with a, a storm scanner by her bed because there's multiple storms where she lives in Tornado Alley and hail falls. We've seen giant hail the size of golf balls fall. And numerous times, my grandma would wake me up in the middle of the night and say, come on, we got to go to the storm cellar. And we would get up and she would go with flashlights and we would go outside in the middle of the storm into the storm cellar with no lights in it, made of concrete, cold, has some canned food in it, a couple of pillows, some blankets. And we would ride the storm out because she was afraid a tornado may come through and kill us. 
Anyone ever been in a storm like that? A storm that just, you don't know if you're going to make it out. You've been on the road. How many of you have been to Florida in the middle of the monsoon season? You ever drove on the, on the road in Florida and all of a sudden this rain falls so heavy that you can't even see the hood of your car? In the middle of the storm. In the middle of a storm. I'll tell you what, when we first moved here, I didn't know that you guys have wind as strong as you do. And we had a mini, I think they said it was a mini tornado come through the back area of where we lived in the Olney area at that time. But the wind was blowing. But here's the thing about a storm. A storm doesn't always give you warning that it's on its way. Come on, amen? I'm already preaching. A storm doesn't let you know. We, we were on the water one time in Florida, out in the middle of a boat, in, in the blue skies, beautiful. We were fishing 25 miles out. The next thing you know, we turn around, and there is a storm cloud coming from this way. So we try to beat it and go this way. Another storm cloud coming from this way. Trapped on the sea. I was like a, a pirate out there, man. This thing was just blowing, and waves were going up and down. We didn't think we were going to make it in. But thank God, Amen. The storm doesn't always give you a warning. And so through this journey of the Apostle Paul, from the Lord that God told him to do, there's a few lessons that I want you to learn. If you're taking notes, write these things down. This is very important today. But this will help you how to not get lost in the chaos of the storm. How to not get lost in the chaos of the storm. Because the storm is necessary. We found that the storm would blow things out that didn't need to be in. The storm would also bring things in that were out. See, all through the word of God, God talks about the ins and the outs, the putting ons and the taking offs, right? It says, put on the garment of praise for what? The spirit of heaviness. So there comes a time in our life that there are things in our life that we can't get out and God will send the wind. God will send the storm and usher these things into your life. And at the same time, things are being ushered in. Other things are being ushered out. Thank God. But you know what? Sometimes God will usher new people into your life. But sometimes God will usher other people out of your life. Number one, if you're taking notes, very important. You ready? Don't mistake the presence of the storm to be the absence of God. Can I say that again? Don't mistake the presence of the storm as being the absence of God. Sometimes when you enter into a storm, and how many of you know there's all kinds of storms? There is health storms. Anyone ever been through a health storm? There's physical storms. There's Financial storms. Anyone ever been through a financial storm? I'm not talking about where it's raining money. I'm talking about where there's an absence. There is a drought. A drought of money. We call it too much month left over at the end of the money. Right? There's emotional storms. Anyone ever been through an emotional storm? Don't lift your wife's hand or your husband's hand. You ever been through an emotional storm? Tom, there's been times I just cried. I didn't even know why I was crying. You ever been there? I know that sounds so stupid. You ever woke up and you just, everything to you was emotional. Everything you just felt like, like I would watch something that I shouldn't be crying over, a TV show, and I'd start crying over a TV show. Something that just doesn't make sense. You ever had one of those days that everything to you, you were touchy, and everything to you, you were on edge, and everything to you aggravated you? Maybe you're having one of those today. All kinds of storms. But I want to talk for a moment about the kind of storms that other people can't see. These are storms called secret storms. Tell your neighbor secret storms. Secret storms. See, when you're marching, someone say marching, come on. When you're marching through, why do we use that word through? Because tell someone we're making it out of this thing today. I love Psalm 23, and I use that word all the time, and I preach about it. I'm going to preach about it until you get sick of it. When David said, yea, though I walk, through the valley of the shadow of death. He said that because he knew he wasn't going to stay there. He put that word through in there because he knew he was going to make it to the other side. But as you are marching through a visible storm that people can see, someone may walk up to you and hand you an umbrella because it's raining. Someone may come up to you and throw you a life raft because you may be drowning in a visible storm. Some help or some assistance. 
Why? Because they are aware of your suffering. Does that make sense? But when you're going through what we call the secret storm, can I tell you, and you guys can relate to this, there is no comfort there. There is no consoling in your secret storm. There is no help in that secret storm. Why? It's simple. Because nobody knows that you're dealing with the secret storm. And most of the time we go through secret storms. Why? Because we don't want to tell someone that we're going through something because we'll either be embarrassed by it. We don't want to feel rejected by it. We don't want them to think that we're a failure because of it. Or we just want to try to be tough and prideful and handle it on our own. Have you ever been through a secret storm in this house? You ever, maybe you're there today. See, because we could come in and look so good. Look around, tell your neighbor they look good today. Come on. I just made a love connection. Oh, uh, you guys don't remember that. Wade does. Chuck Woolery, you know who he is. But we, we, we put our best on and we put our makeup on and I don't, but you put your makeup on. But can I tell you, just as you, you put yourself together and you put the makeup on, you can come in and put your smile on too and no one knows it. You may be here today and look like everything's okay and everything is going fine, but it's not. You may be going through the worst storm of your life, but the people around you don't even know it. That's why you're not getting the consoling. That's why you're not getting the help. That's why things are the way they are is because you're going through a secret storm and no one knows it. We talked about it last week. You are only received how you are perceived. People can only receive you by how they perceive you, how they view you, and you're treated by what people see of you. They can only perceive by what you show them. Does that make sense? See, they may still be jealous of the car you're driving, but they might not know that you're two payments behind. Come on. None of y'all ever been there before. They may be envious of the promotion you got, but they didn't. But they don't know that you haven't slept in a month because of the responsibility of the weight of this new promotion that you've got. And now you're in this storm and nobody knows it. And you're in this secret storm. And when we're in the chaos of the storm, when we're marching through the darkest time, through the valley of the shadow of death, we have a tendency to say, where are you, God? Like Job. See, Job said, I looked for him. He was there a minute ago, but I can't find him now. Job actually said this. He said, I looked on my right and I couldn't find him. He said, I looked on my left and I perceived him not. Where is God in this storm? Why? Because we buy into the notion that if God was with us, we would have no storm. We've bought into the notion that if God were really with us, then we would be happy and not sad. We have bought into the notion that if God was with us, then everything would go smoothly. We would have no problems. That if God were really with us, then we would have no family problems. If He were with us, then our bills would be paid and we wouldn't be struggling financially. How could God be with us in the middle of foreclosure? How could God be with us when they're coming to take my car? How could God be with us and we have cancer still? Come on. How could God be with us and we're going through the worst pain in our family that we've ever been through? Where is God? Job said, I can't figure it out. How could my kid die and God be with me? How could my house be on fire and God be with me? He says, I looked for him. I didn't see him. I didn't see him. Have you ever looked for God, but you didn't see him? Have you ever asked for God to come down in, but you didn't see him, you didn't hear him? You couldn't even sense it, but you called upon him. I didn't see him. He says, I looked on the right and I didn't see him. I looked behind me. I didn't see you there either. He says, I looked in front of me because I thought that you were going to lead the way, but I didn't see you there either. But the truth of the matter is this. You cannot see in a storm. You can't. When a storm is around you, it cuts off the visibility of what it is that you're trying to see. We're going to get deep, amen? 
When the storm is raging, when the wind is blowing, when the rain is pouring down, when everything around you is going chaotic, you can't see. And sometimes because you can't see, it's easy to lose direction. And when you can't see, you're wondering where your help is coming from. That's why he told us to walk by faith and not by sight. I'm going to tell you, don't look for God to be sensual in your storm. Because he will not appeal to your senses. Why? Because he knows that your senses add to your comfort. And God will not make you comfortable in your storm. You cannot get comfortable in the storm because the storm will then consume you. But just because you are in the presence of a storm, the storm does not negate the presence of God, nor does it indicate the absence of His presence. In fact, if you really want God to do His best in your life, go get in trouble. Because that's where He works the best. Amen? See, the Bible says He knows how to visit us. It says He inhabits the praises of His people. Right? But He lives in our trouble. The Bible says that he is a very present help in time of trouble. If you're looking for God, tell someone he's in the storm. Come on. He may not be saying anything at the time, Peter, but I guarantee you he's down in the boat. Don't think that he's going to get up and jump off the boat the moment the storm hits. Just because you're in a storm. Because he's with you in the storm. The Bible says that he said he will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never leave you, never forsake you. He is always with you. Just look at someone needs to hear this and say, God is with you right now. You might not see him. You might not feel him, but he's there, I promise you. He is there. He is in this room right now with us. He is with you. Look, he's not only with you when, when all the money's coming in. He's not only with you when the marriage is good. He's not only with you when you're on vacation and everything around you seems fun. God is with you in every moment. God is with you the most, I believe, the closest to you in the storm. He promised. Isn't that good? I got an earthly father as well. And I know when my dad promises me something that he will come through with it. He'll come through with it. There have been times that he had promised me something, and, and, and I know my dad traveled a lot growing up. He, he went over to Russia to do mission trips and Israel all over. But when he come back from Russia, he says, I promise you, son, I will bring you something back from Russia. The moment he got off the airplane and, and he was driving and pulling into the driveway, I was looking out the window to see the car coming down the road. But the excitement in me, too, was to see my father, but also to see what my father had got me. I was nine. And he pulled into the driveway. I hugged my dad. And the first thing I said, just like every kid, what'd you bring me? He brought me a lot of cool things from Russia. And he brought me this, I don't know what they're called, but it's like these little round dolls. They're wooden. What's it called? Okay, nesting doll. I'll go, I couldn't say the other words, like Botrushka or something. But you take it apart, and there's another one inside that looks just like it. You take that apart and there's another one inside of that. But the thing that I'm trying to get across is when my dad promised me something, I knew he was going to come through with it. And that's how it is with God too. God promises that he will be with you. What is a promise? It's like me writing you a check. All right? That check is a promise. You can't spend it right now, but it is a promise that the money is behind that check. And whenever God promises you something, he says, you may not have it in your hand right now. He says, but I promise you, amen, there's coming a time when you can cash that. There's coming a time where I'm going to allow you to spend what it is that I have given to you. Did he promise you anything? Is anyone holding on to the promises of God? We used to sing an old song. I ain't going to sing it. It's called Standing on the Promises. How many of you remember that? Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, safe and secure. See, y'all know it. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God. Man, I don't know if we really realized how powerful that song used to be. Still is. 
Are you holding on to a promise today that God has given you? Who's holding on to a promise? Maybe it hasn't happened yet, but you're holding on to a promise that God has given you. Maybe you're in this room and, and you've been in bad health, but God has promised you your healing. Come on. Maybe you're standing here in this room today and, and your children are wayward and they're lost in the world and they're lost in sin, but God has promised you that they would come to know him. And you're holding on to that promise. Maybe you're in this room today and God has promised you something that would happen in your business or in your finances and, and it hasn't happened yet. But tell someone, I still believe, come on. I'm holding on to it today and believing that God is going to come through. He might not come through now, but can I tell you, he is with you in the middle of this. He is with you in the storm until it happens. God will sustain you until it happens. But I'm holding on. Tell someone I'm holding on. He promised me. Can I tell you my favorite verse in the Bible? And this is a promise from God. It's in Isaiah 43. He says, when you pass through the waters, I feel the Holy Spirit. He says, I will be with you. With you. He says, and through the rivers, he says, they shall not overflow thee. And when you walk through the fires, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame be kindled upon thee. See, he wouldn't have said that if his present wasn't visible. Because you never promised the obvious. He was saying, when you pass through the waters, he says, I'll be with you every step of the way. You may not see me. You may not feel me. You might not even sense me. But the whole time that you were paddling your arms, trying to stay afloat, you thought you were swimming by yourself, but you weren't. I was there the whole time. I was keeping you afloat. And eventually that thing that you think is going to go over your head will be under your feet, Peter, in Jesus' name. Amen? Don't let the very presence of the storm cause you to lose awareness that God, the God who is controlling the storm, is there. Are you steering your life by what you see? Or are you steering your life by what you believe today? I have you do this a lot, but I believe in it. I want you to look at someone and tell them to say, I'm coming out of this madness. Come on. Sometimes you just got to be strong enough to say it. I'm coming out of this madness. I'm coming out of this madness. Look, I don't have any details right now, but tell someone I'm coming out. Amen. I don't know where the money's coming from, but I'm coming out of this madness in Jesus name. I don't know whether they're going to lay hands on me or I'm going to have to have it done by medicine, but I'm coming out in Jesus name. I don't know whether I'm going to have to come down to an altar and they're going to have to dump oil all over my head. Or God's going to do it while I'm driving down the street talking to him by myself. But I'm coming out of this in Jesus' name. See, I believe that we ought to make that declaration right now. Just lift your hands and say, I'm coming out of this madness in the name of Jesus. I'm coming out. I don't know how, but I am declaring in the name of Jesus because I'm holding on to his promises that I'm coming out. See, if God promised you other things, this thing can't take you down. Amen? If there are things that are not done in your life that God told you would be done and that you would be doing and seeing, this little thing can't take you out. I'm making it through, amen? I'm on my way out. I'm on my way out. I may have to crawl. I may have to wait. I may have to suffer a little bit. I may have to hold my peace, but when everything is said and done... I'm coming out of this madness in Jesus' name. How? Tell someone because he's with me. Amen? He's with me. He's with me in the middle of the storm. See, the storm may blow all kind of things and all kind of people out of my life, but one thing I know for sure, it will never blow Jesus or blow the presence of God out of my life. It may blow you out of my life. It may blow you out of my life, you, you and you, but I know that I have one passenger that will never leave me nor forsake me and God is with me through my storm, amen? Tell someone he's my ride and die, amen? He's with me through the whole thing, through thick and thin, for richer or for poorer, sickness and in health, amen? Till death do us part. God is with me. He's with me. But we forget that. You know, st statistics, I can't talk today. Statistics say that if an elderly person, we don't have any of those here, we have wise people. <laughs> if up in their older age, they have anything living in the house with them, anything, tell someone anything, anything that is alive in the house, it doesn't even have to be another person, that they will live longer. It actually,
actually says that if they have a cat or a dog or even a goldfish, something to feed, something to worry about, something to take care of. If you've got anything that is living in your house with you, then you will live longer. It made me think. If a cat in a dog's presence can make me live longer, how much more would the presence of God increase my life once I realize that I'm not living by myself? Once I realize that I'm not in this by myself, I'm not raising these kids by myself, I'm not going through this problem by myself. Don't allow the storm to make you doubt the presence of God. And now my heart went out to Paul. As I read this again, and I seen that he's already been through so much. You ever felt just bad for someone? It's like, man, <laughs> I ain't got any luck. Stuff just keeps happening to them. But there's a purpose, amen. He's been through so much, and all of a sudden, the Lord is using this ship to get him into his destiny. How many of you know that God always has some form, some mode of transportation, no matter what it may be, to get you to where he wants you to be? It may be through another person. It may be through a situation. It may be through a storm. It may be through a job change. But God has a mode of transportation to help you get into your destiny. And then the very thing that he was counting on to get him there. The very thing that he was riding on to get him there. The very thing that he was protected by started coming apart. What do you do when what God gave you to ride in what do you do when what God gave you to get there on starts coming apart? Do you give up? Do you throw your hands up? Do you throw the towel in? Do you leave? I suggest this today. And I want you to hear this, that God did not promise the ship. But God promised you. You'll get that tonight when you get home. God never promised that the ship would make it. He promised that you would make it. God never promised that what you're using in this season would last you and be used in this season. Does that make sense? Which brings me to my second point as I'm getting ready to close in just about five minutes. Is this. Don't preserve the temporary. Don't preserve the temporary. See, God promised to get you. Tell someone you. He promised to get you there. But he didn't say how. God promised to bring you through. But he didn't say through whom. And if you're not careful, what you'll do is you will exhaust all of your energy into preserving the boat. And not understanding that success is not, des it's not designed and defined by preserving the temporary. And you'll put all your time and your work into something that God only gave you for a season. Can I tell you that every blessing that God gives you is not meant to last in every season and in every journey? God brings some people into your life sometimes to get you from point A to point B. I'm saying just because the ship is coming apart doesn't mean that you have to come apart. Amen? Just because what God used to get you to where He wants you to pee, B is now, now coming apart. Edit that out of this sermon. <laughs> I'm going to hear about this all day. <laughs> Just because what God used to get you to where you are now is falling apart. It doesn't mean that you have to fall apart. Amen? What do you mean? I feel like they're trying to kick me out of this job. or I feel like they're pushing me out. It's not that they're pushing you out. It's that God wants you out. How about we view it that way? Amen? These friends don't want to be around me anymore. Yeah, they don't want to be around you because you got the light of God in you. And you convict them. They don't call you anymore. Why? Because you're following God. And they don't like that. Let's just face that fact. Tell someone it wasn't you. It's them. That's the truth. They know that when you're around, even if you don't say nothing, they're going to feel guilty because they can't do the things that they used to do with you now that they're with you again. So all of a sudden, this, this mode of transportation, this group that I used to hang with doesn't want to be with me anymore, and now it's falling apart 
Friendships, old friendships are falling apart. Relationships are falling apart. It doesn't feel the same anymore. It's not supposed to feel the same. Tell someone this is a new ride, amen? God's got something better for you. Look, the basket that baby Noah was in, you remember that? I said, I said Noah, didn't I? <laughs> do me a favor. Do this. Reach your hand out. <laughs> Say, God, take control of his tongue in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, <laughs> the basket that Moses was in as a baby. Oh. That was only meant to be for a season. Amen? Season. Tell someone he grew out of it. Noah's time building the boat that he brought his family through the worst storm was only meant, tell someone, for a season. Can you imagine being on that boat with Paul at that time? He was tired and he was weary and he was stressed. The thing that he was counting on to get him to the other side. In other words, that job that you thought that you were going to retire on to get you to the other side. That house that you may have thought that you were going to help raise your grandchildren in to get you to the other side. It's now all falling apart and you're losing things and you're losing people. And the storm got it. How many of you ever lost anything in the storm? You ever lost something in the storm? I'm not talking about a visit. You, you may be here today, and I know people from New Orleans and all over that have lost things in the middle of hurricanes and floods and, and been down to nothing. But I'm talking about in your life. Maybe you're here today, and you have a relationship that you feel like you have lost something in. Maybe you and your spouse are not getting along like you used to. Maybe you're here today and you feel like the storm made you lose your mind. Maybe in the middle of that storm, somewhere along the way, you lost your joy. Have you lost your peace? Have you ever lost your temper? It's funny they say you lost your temper. And all of a sudden, all these other emotions come out. The anger comes out. The blaming comes out. The excuses come out. And the storm is raging around us. The wind is blowing. And to be honest, it's scary. We're tough. We can handle a lot. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how strong you are. Sometimes a storm can be overwhelming. And in the middle of the storm, there has been times where I had thought that God had left me. And I looked around and I, I couldn't see him. I couldn't feel him. I couldn't even hear him. And it wasn't that he left. It's that he was working the whole time. He's in control of the storm. He's the one that tells the wind to blow or not to blow. He's the one that tells the clouds to drop the rain on you or to subside. Amen. He is the one that calls the light into the darkness. And for those of you that are here today and you are going through a storm, it's easy to hide, isn't it? And maybe you've tried to call out for help and there's no one around you that can hear you. Maybe you have tried to show others what you're going through in your own way, but they can't see it. And you don't know you're left from your right. You get disoriented. And you don't know where it's coming from, but you need your joy back. You don't know where it's coming from, but you need God to intervene and step in because you don't know how you're going to pay your way out of tomorrow. You don't know how it's going to happen because the relationship has just been through so much, you don't know if it can ever be repaired. You don't know if you could stand going to another doctor because every doctor tells you the same thing, that there's no hope. But can I tell you that Jesus is there? He is there. He is with you. He is walking with you through this thing. You don't have to struggle alone. And you're going to make it through to the other side in Jesus' name. 
I want you to stand to your feet, every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you lost some friends in the storm. Maybe you lost some people in the storm. Maybe you lost some relationships in the storm. And it made you feel like a failure. But can I tell you today, you are not a failure. Tell your neighbor you're not a failure. See, that was only a temporary blessing because if it was meant to stay, then it couldn't leave. Come on. If it was meant to stay in your life, then it could not leave because God commanded it to be there. And what God commands has to stay. Could it be that the actual destruction of the boat might just be the announcement that you have arrived at your destination? Isn't it funny? All of a sudden, this boat is now destroyed. And because of it, the Bible said that Paul floated in on a piece of what was getting in there. You may feel like you're on your last leg, hanging on by a a thread, but God will get you there. If he's got to use a piece of the boat, he will get you there. If he's got to use a whale to get you there, Jonah, he'll get you there, amen? If he's got to use a small stone, David, to get you into the palace, he will get you there. If he's got to take you, Joshua, from a pit to bring you into the palace, he'll get you there. God will get you there. You are not done. I feel like I need to tell someone in this room today, you are on your way to Rome. And there's a purpose in Rome for you for what you got to do, Paul. You're on your way there. But are you willing to listen to God and know that there is a storm that is raging around you? Look, the greater the calling, the greater the storm. But the greater the storm, the greater the presence of God in the storm. I want you to join hands with your neighbor in this room, if you will, as we close. Just squeeze the hand tightly. In the name of Jesus, just look at them and say, you're too close to quit. Come on. We can see the shore. You're too close to give up. The storm may be blowing all around you, but we can see the shore. You're too close to give up. Now I want you to begin to pray with me in Jesus. and Say, in Jesus' name, say, I rebuke the spirit of giving up right now. I rebuke the spirit of giving up in Jesus' name. Listen, I feel like telling someone, don't give up on your life. Amen. Just pray with me. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't give up on your family. And for God's sake, don't give up on yourself. God, take me through this. Whatever it is, Lord God, bring me through this. In the name of Jesus, as they sing this song, I want you just to begin to pray. And then we're going to leave. We're going to have a good time later at this party. But I pray that you just use your voice right now before we leave this house. For some of you, you have stopped marching. You stop marching. See, we are constantly marching through this life and this journey, marching through this battle. For some of us, we've stopped. And we're like the children of Israel wandering around in the wilderness. But God gave you some marching orders today. Amen? Don't stop. Don't quit. He's with you. There's a reason for it. There's a purpose for it. You're on your way to Rome and God has something on the other side of that. Look, people are counting on you. They're waiting on you to get through this because they need you. They need what you have been through as a testimony to help them get through the other side. We're going to sing this song right here. But I pray, look, here's what I want you to do. We're going to sing the song that we sang at the end. I pray that we have some people that come up here and just worship with us. I'm not telling you to come out if you have a problem or a need. I know this is different today. I like different, don't you? I don't want to do the same thing over and over. It becomes ritualistic we got to shake this thing up a little bit. Why? Because we have been too comfortable in the boat for too long. Way too comfortable. What do you mean? I'm not here to put a performance on. We're not here to entertain you. We're here to break free. We're here to break through. Amen. We're here to, to break the bondage, to rebuke the enemy that is trying to attack our family on every level. Whose family feels like they've been under attack this year? Anybody? Man, I claim 2020 to be amazing. But can I tell you what? I claimed it and I believed it, but we have been attacked worse than we ever have. And I thought, God, how could this happen? You promised me, Lord, and I claimed something good. You know what God said? He said, if you claim something big and good, expect the big storm. Expect the big attack. And if you can fight that and defeat that, I can see that you can handle going to the next level. Amen? I can handle 2019 because I went through it. 
But God said there's a new enemy on the other side of 2020. And you have to be prepared to go through it to get to it in Jesus' name. Amen? Sing this song. If you want to come up and worship with us, you can do that. And then we're going to leave this place. Thank you, Jesus. Just dim those lights a little bit. I want us just to worship before we leave this house.